and you have to work around that. So what we end up with, we, we, well, here, let me back up for a minute. When we, when we laid out those schemes, and we did the preliminary grading, we preliminary laid out the site, everything from grades to parking to infrastructure to access, to access down along Columbia. What we looked, what we looked at really were just two footprints. The footprint with, with the police station and a township building and a footprint that adds a library. And the reason we stuck to those two is because they're the two biggest changes. There are certain anomalies of doing just a police station or as, as the other schemes have, but they don't have as big an impact on the site as these two options do. And as we grade out the site, you can see these dark lines that Chris shows. This line's a retaining wall that we need to accommodate grades. This line's a retaining wall that we would need to accommodate grains. And this line's a retaining wall that we need to accommodate grains. Very important from a site, site costing standpoint. We also, and I'll go into a little bit more detail when we talk about traffic, but we, we provided access Via, via Columbia in two places on the property. And to provide this access, the most efficient way to do it is actually to reconstruct Columbia. So we have to raise the grades on Columbia to have grades that are, that are usable to get from Manoa into the site. And as I, when I talk about traffic, I'll tell you why it's so important to get from Manoa, from Manoa into the property from, a, from an overall traffic standpoint. So as you grade out the site, one of the couple anomalies that jump out, everybody probably might remember there was proposed parking up in this area when we had a two-dimensional plan. The third dimension uh, makes that parking prohibitive because that retaining wall would be seven, eight feet high and would be kind of close to the ball field. So we pulled that down and pulled it away from the ball fields for, for, for logical reasons. And, and as we put these two accesses in, there is some parking that comes out of that area. So the, the net parking stays the same, but it, can get, it gets moved around a little bit. All that, all that was used for, for costing, and what we did was we were able to provide uh, uh, IMC and Mike with quantities regarding everything from paving to cuts and fills to storm sewers to some sanitary sewers, and, and we were able to to come up with uh, a logical rock allowance, because we certainly would anticipate some rock, bedrock in this construction, and some logical uh, environmental allowances in case we run into any environmental issues. The second, the second layout, as I mentioned, was with the library, where we, we have a lot more parking, and, and we still have the parking up on this side. This is a parking structure. And one of the important things about grading out the site is we know that the top end of the structure is roughly 280 in elevation. The bottom end, which exists, is roughly 265. So that gives you a 15-foot high wall in the parking structure across the back. So that, and, and again, when it comes to costing, we want to make sure we make accommodations for that. So as we sat down with IMC, right across the back here, we've got a 15-foot high wall to, to accommodate that parking structure. We, we, do no, we no longer see a need for the access north of the stadium from Darby Road, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail with the traffic. So that, that, that was the anomalies and, and details associated with the site that allow us to take a two-dimensional plan that we had four months ago and turn it into a, three, a preliminary three-dimensional plan and get some, some, good, some better, more detailed costing. Second thing we looked at was traffic. Um, it, we have a lot of empirical data with traffic. We, we, we were actually very happy the way the traffic um, came together in terms of, of empirical data. The, the township police helped us, and we actually counted with the strips, the trips coming in and out of the skating property, in and out of this township building, in and out of a recreation office, and in and out of the township park, uh, library parking lot. We also, uh, we, we did, Pannoni did, we did manual counts at the Darby and Manoa intersection. And it was important to have those counts coming in out of these parking lots because if we're going to project traffic, we want to make sure we're projecting it reasonably accurately. We know the skating property is very difficult to project and predict. Those counts occurred after, after hockey season before softball season. So that was, that was a little bit uh, in, in a gap there, but they are the actual counts. We know that we know at the library, there's more use at the library than the parking lot accommodates. So the township building, recreation office, we think is is fairly well captured. So what we did is we took what are called ITE projections, Institute of Traffic Engineers, and we compared those to the counts, and we came up with with very very reasonable projections for the township building and library using the ITE numbers, and we used the actual numbers for the police station and the recreation office. 
And, and, that, and you can see, you can see what we have for existing peak at the, at the stadium. We have an AM peak hour of 75 trips. We have a PM peak hour of 130. The township building, which we project as a, as a, a AM peak hour of 45 trips, a PM peak of 65, recreations 25 and 20, and then the library is 35 and 205 in the PM. Again, it, we're, we're, very, we're very comfortable with the fact that both the counts and the IT match up enough to give us, give us some comfort level that they're, that they're matching up the same. The second thing we did was count the intersection. We counted, the, we counted it for, for the better part of a day, and the intersection has 2,200 trips in the AM peak, which is roughly 7 to 8 AM, and you can see 45 pedestrians that use the intersection. The PM peak, which is about a quarter to five to a quarter to six, there's 2,500 vehicles. Um, Roughly, roughly, we, we figured there's probably 15,000 or so vehicles coming up and down the Darby Road, probably about two-thirds of that coming up and down Manoa Road, uh, comparable maybe Burmont Road, um, not quite, obviously not quite Township Line. So it's, it's a fairly, uh, obviously, a, a he fairly heavily used intersection, but it's an intersection that functions very well right now. The level of service, with the exception of one movement, um, functions fairly well there. Uh, just, to, just to give a little bit more information to put it in perspective, when we, when we counted the stadium, I mentioned a peak hour of 160, we, we counted 1,100 trips a day in, in, on average. This, town, this, town, this building, we counted 500 trips a day on average. And, and the library, uh, even though it's a, it's a relatively modest lot, we counted 90 trips in a peak hour coming in and out of the lot and um, 880 trips on a day that were done by count. The stadium site is obviously the most difficult site to, to figure. So, so here's, here's our site, and here's, and here's our traffic um, uh, conclusions. Number one, as, uh, as I mentioned, Lori and I met with a PennDOT representative. The PennDOT representative mentioned, and he, when he looks at the site, he says, hey, I got two concerns, none of which really were any different than we thought. Number one, he thought there may be a need to have access from Darby Road onto the site north of the stadium towards the township building. The other thing that, that he mentioned that, that shows up right in the concept plans right from the beginning is access from the site to Manoa Road. As we did our evaluation, we counted the intersection, we did the trips, we did the trip distribution where people will be coming from to the site. We don't find an empirical need to have an access to the site from Darby Road. The stacking lane on, on Darby Road going going in a north direction is more than adequate to accommodate any, any lefts that are coming this way um, now. And, and what, I'm, what, what this scenario shows is if we had, if we had the police station, I mean, a township building to the site. The, the, and even if we, when, and I'll show you on the next slide, but even with the full use, if we had a library, there's still not a need to, empirical need to accommodate traffic going north on Darby coming into the site north of the stadium. Biggest reason is the distribution. As everybody knows, Upper Darby is the closest, uh, is closest to this property to, to the south. So we don't anticipate a lot of the traffic coming from the south on Darby Road. We anticipate it coming from the north on Darby Road and frankly coming from the, from the west on Manoa, and that's how that would distribute. So what this slide shows is that when you, when you take the existing trips and you project uh, the township building and recreation building going on to the same site with the police station, that you have to lengthen the left turn lane. The improvement, the off-site improvement that's needed is a lengthening of the left turn lane on Manoa Road. That, that, that left turn lane's gotta go about, about double the length that it is now. And when you lengthen that lane, you have to add the appropriate taper. You have to do curb and sidewalk work on this side of the road to accommodate it. And there's some utility lines and utility poles in that area. So working with Mike, we figured that cost is about, about $125,000 worth of offsite cost to accommodate, accommodate the additional less that'll be needed there. The next, the, next, oh, sorry, sorry. the next thing we looked at is to, is to accommodate the library site also, in addition to the township facilities. And you can see the left turn lane will have to be about three times the size it is now to accommodate the people that want to turn left coming up Manoa Road. And, and the reason we have so many people coming left to get up Manoa Road, even though you're allowed to exit the site, 
and go on to Darby Road, when you exit, you got to jump two lanes and get all the way over into the left turn lane. It's a very difficult movement, especially at rush hour. That's why it's so important to provide access for the general public and for the police onto Manoa Road. In addition, with the extra traffic, you'd have to lengthen this left turn lane on Darby Road a little bit. That's about double the cost. That's about $250,000 uh, worth of off-site improvements. As I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the level of service at the intersection is actually pretty good now. The overall level of service does, does not degrade too much. It's the left turn movement. I probably don't have to tell everybody that takes the biggest hit with, with this type of improvement. Currently, it's what we call level service C. There's a 30-second 30, 30 delay if you get in the back of the queue to make a left turn lane during rush hour, left turn during rush hour. Uh, with the township building, it would go, go to a level of service D with about a 38, 39 second delay. And with the township building and the library, it would go to a level of service E with about a 75 second delay um, for a left turn at rush hour. That's the Achilles tendon of, of this intersection. A couple, of, a couple other modest things to, to note, again, from a traffic standpoint. Um, the additional peak hour traffic that would go here will not be a net number. Um, it's a gross number. It would certainly be anticipated that any buildings that, that would be relocated here would continue to generate their own traffic. We don't know what it is. Should the library come here or some of the township building come to that site? Uh, we certainly don't know today what would, what would replace those, but there will be traffic associated with it. So we're not taking traffic from two other properties and putting it here. We're taking traffic from two other properties, putting it here, and it gets regenerated back on the other properties. Not saying it's good or bad, it's just my job to make sure that, that everybody realizes that. Then the last thing that that we want to point out, and, and it was a little bit, in, I thought it was a little bit interesting, is to show how the three sites park in the community. And so we have we have the town, we have the stadium site, and we would have a new building out in this area. What we did, just so just to make it easier for everybody to relate to the, the scale and the order of magnitude, this radius in blue, this, this circle, you're going to see it on the other two slides. What we did is we, we, we took that circle from about the center of the proposed building and ran it through the middle of the stadium. That picks up most, if not all, of the on-site parking for most of the scenarios. And I thought that, we all thought that was good because it could help on the next two slides so you can get a feel for, for the, the dimensions of this property versus, versus the other properties. But here's the on-site parking. It's along Darby Road. Probably nobody's surprised. That's a four-lane road. There's some metered parking there. There's some non-metered parking there. There's some restricted parking, like 15-minute loading zones. There's no parking on Manoa Road, and we don't, we don't even go in their neighborhoods and look at available parking in there. And we did that on the other two sites. And just for comparison purposes, here's the library. Same radius. And you can see the same thing. you got the parking on Darby Road, some of which is metered some of which is not, some of, some of which has some restrictions. Um, uh, mill, mill does not have available parking. And then, and then alongside the, the middle school, as, as the board certainly knows, there's the, the perpendicular parking, if, uh, some of which falls into that radius. And when you have, when you have the exhibits, I know I'm giving you a lot of information. When you have the exhibits, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the actual numbers associated with this. And in the last one, we showed parked in the neighborhood is a township building. Same thing, here's the radius. Blue line, same situation. Darby Road, we have some metered parking, we have some unmetered parking. No parking on the, on the other side of Darby Road. Uh, amongst all these businesses on, on Eagle Road, we have parking. And then just outside the radius, the bottom left there on, on Darby Road is, is the municipal lot. So that, that, that um, shows all my presentation focusing on, the, on those three items. Um, as a further part of the presentation to the board, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't touch on finance. And um, to that end, um, I've asked Amy uh, to work to get together some numbers for me. Amy's invited um, Gordon Walker here to talk about borrowing money and, um, and has given us sort of the bullets, the bullet points that you see before us. Um, Mr. Walker is going to be discussing the first three of the bullet points, the current borrowing condition, um, how we would go about borrowing, um, 
and the annual debt service required under each borrowing scenario. And I think that um, Amy is going to follow up with some real estate tax implications, and she has um, a series of slides to go through as well. Uh, Mr. Walker. I think this board uh, remembers, everyone on the board remembers Mr. Walker. He's been, got at this, uh, got at us through some financial uh, advisements the last few years, uh, at least since I've been here as the township manager. Thank you, Gordon. Also, I want to remind everybody that this presentation will be on our website tomorrow afternoon for everyone to look at. Thanks, Gordon. It's a big big presentation, so it's going to take a while to get on. So it'll be tomorrow afternoon it'll be on the website. Okay, good, good evening, everybody. I uh, just want to introduce my colleague, Jamie Schlesinger, who's been helping me with the numbers, et cetera. So um, we'll start right into the market. The market's very good. On the first page here, um, the middle, the middle the, the top chart is a 10-year history of interest rates since 2004, and the bottom chart is the 20-year, and since we're talking about probably 30-year bond issues, I'll just touch on the, the, the 20 one at the bottom. But if you look back when we issued the bonds in 2010, the 20-year um, the rates were about a 380, and if you see on the very right, we're about a 3% now. Last year we issued when the 20-year uh, rates were about a four and a quarter, and now we're down to, down to 3%. So there's been a considerable drop since 2010, and there's been a, uh, a, a huge drop in rates um, just in the past year, contrary to all the predictions of, of Wall Street. So it, uh, everybody thought rates were going higher at the beginning of the year, and they've been going lower for many reasons. Uh, so it just proves that on, on interest rates, the experts are always wrong, or usually wrong. So um, the next page is the current debt of the township, and we have the 2010 um, issue, 26,280,000, and the 2013 issue and 10 million. Um, if they stay reasonably low like they are today, there'll be some refinancings uh, available to you. In it's gonna, you're gonna have to wait a while. We get closer to the call dates in 2018, but uh, very few bond issues reach a call date where there is not a refinancing in the lower <coughs> rates. So something to look forward to in the future. <clears throat> uh, let's get into this, uh, the, all the various projects or schemes as they're called in the handout. Um, there are seven here and um, <coughs> project cost is the third line called project fund deposit. That's the proceeds of the one or the various bond issues after cost. Uh, no, it's not the proceeds. It's the proceeds plus the cash you have available from last year's issue. So there's approximately three million available from last year's issue, right, Amy, to apply to this project, plus the net proceeds of the one or the uh, two bond issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get into the subsequent pages in a minute, but just running across uh, here, all but one of these involve either two issues or three bond issues for reasons I'm going to explain, okay? So why don't we turn over, <coughs> again, these are the debt service cost based on today's interest rates, even if you're issuing in 2015 or 16, because we don't know where the market's going to be, we're simply using today's rates, your AA2 rating, and where would you be on 30-year issues for all of them. So let's, I want to go through not the numbers per se, but I'd like to just go through the financing strategy and tell you some of the options that you have. <clears throat> so, like for example, on Scheme 1, um, you'll see there where it says BQ or non-BQ. <coughs> we want to keep the bond issues at no more than $10 million if we can. <coughs> One, you get lower interest rates because the banks can buy the bonds. Secondly, we can have a shorter call feature, meaning if we issued in 15, we can have one five years out instead of seven or 10. And thirdly, you don't want to issue all the debt up front anyhow because you don't need all the money right away and it's going to be sitting there or you're going to be paying three or whatever percent on the money and you're going to be earning virtually nothing. So there is that advantage 
those three advantages far outweigh the, the small extra cost of doing two or three issues. So, for example, in the blue, one strategy here would be to issue 10 million this year at the end of the year, which together with the three you have would give you 12, eight uh, in round numbers. That is on bank qualified interest rates. The second issue in order to come up with the right amount of money is listed at 10445 We just ran this for purposes of tonight at the higher interest rates, slightly higher, about an eighth of a percent, rather than showing a little financing for 445000 When we get to next year, if you adopt this plan, we can decide do we want to pare down next year's issue to $10 million, or do we want to divide it into five and five, or do we just want to go ahead and issue a non-bank qualified issue. There are various options. Uh, and again, the, the numbers listed are the debt service cost based on today's interest rates, your current rating, um, and you can see at all 30 year issues. You can do a 25 or a 20, but for purposes of tonight, we're using 30. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of these in great detail, but some of these, I wanna show you some of your options. For example, the next one, on page five, scheme two, where you need 29.3 million, uh, you can accomplish that most effectively by issuing three separate bond issues, one this year, one next, and one the year after. Now I have 10, 10, and 6.8. If you decide on scheme two, we don't have to issue 10 million this year. We could do 6.8 this year if you don't need $13 million this year, well, let's defer some of the issuance uh, to, the, to um, maybe spread, the, spread it out and put some of this, or, or maybe we do 10 this year and we don't do the whole 10 next year and move some of that to column three, the lime colored. So again, as long as we keep each one at 10 million or less, that is the best deal for Haverford. Um, <clears throat> Now, there may be circumstances where we need, uh, next year we need more than, maybe we need to issue next year 16 million six. 